Hey everybody, this is Pixel Core Gear Media Tech Live, our usual Thursday night live show, this time with Brent Bai. I'm Kevin Hansen, I'm sitting in for Alex Lindsay, who is on assignment. assignment. So, this week on Gear Media Tech, we're going to talk about camera movement and rigging options. Mm -hmm. And Brent Bai is, um, as far as I'm concerned, a world class leader in all things camera and all things grippery. <laughs> in, our, in our circles here in the studio. So I've, people that don't see specifically the bigger picture of where we are, we're in the Pixel Core studio and right next door is the Twit studio, right? And so throughout the years and even in your other space, in you know, Market Street, the old Pixel Core uh, studio right. over there, constantly rigging cameras, right? And here, constantly rigging cameras. And when we were over I mean, I'm always doing the same thing there. Well, from the very first, um, my very first involvement with Pixel Core, mm -hmm. there has been Brent By, the guy who was really good at cameras and rigging, <laughs> and it just goes together. He was, he right? was just yeah. the best. He was yeah. always said to be the best. Oh, so thanks. that was always the standard that I looked at, and always wanted to get a little bit closer to Brent's ability. Now, there's now a way to do that. Well, let's disprove all of that hype um, right now. Let's, uh... We'll get into more details a little bit later in the show, but coming up in a couple of weeks mm -hmm. is a class that Brent's teaching called... Um, it's called Camera Cam Light Shadow. And that's happening from October 17th to 19th. 17, 18, 19. Right. Three days, yeah. And it's going to be just that, a lesson in camera light and shadow. And it's really meant to take... 20 years of experience of being around cameras, lights, and grip equipment, which creates shadow, and applying that to new media production. So there's going to be a whole lot of looking at still shots that I've taken on set and all the experience that came along with that and actually creating different environments as if you were on set, a music video environment, a TV commercial environment, and then a feature film environment, or each of the three days and the way we're going to break it down. So it's going to be very intensive, very very broad scale, but, but yet at the same time, just, I wouldn't say film school in a box, but it's all experience and it's all, it's going to be good. Well, I, I have to admit, um, for at least a couple of years, ever since I first heard the first inkling of a rumor mm. of you coming in and teaching a class, I've wanted to take it. Oh, yeah. And uh, I've always tried to make sure that any time there was a rumor, that I was free then to do it. <laughs> well, there was the Grip Guide happening. show all those years ago, and I still get emails right. of people upset that that dropped, but... This is such an evolution of that, the Grip Guide show that's on, I think it's still on pixelcore.tv, right? Right. So this is a long-awaited update of all that stuff. So. Well, I'm looking forward to the class. Yeah. So why don't we talk about some of those concepts and show some pictures and, and just, okay. let's just, let's just converse about what you and I have been doing a lot of, which so is rigging cameras, right? So rigging cameras. Yeah. Um, well, my... My small experience in rigging cameras has mostly been involved with our motion capture system. Right. We have a 24 camera OptiTrack motion capture, si capture system. 24, I didn't realize that. And in the Market Street office, our, the way we mounted the cameras was a little bit, it was a little bit unsteady. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, C-stand arms suspended from a drop ceiling roof with scissor clamps. Oh. That's good, yeah. The air conditioner will turn on and it'll wiggle. Right. And Anytime so. anybody would walk by, right. we would, well, we would lose calibration. Right, right. But right. we couldn't stop. We just had to keep going. And what does that take? A couple millimeters of movement, and that's sure. If a camera off. moves and doesn't come back in the same position, right, then it's not in the same position anymore. Which is going to be be reporting constant, where the markers right. are. Yeah. Hmm. Now that's here, troublesome. In this studio, in this space here, right, I have mounted into the rafters some speed rail flange clamps. Mm -hmm. Inserted into those clamps are poles just like this. Mm -hmm. um, inch and a half speed rail right. painted black. Okay. And on each pole I have mounted two of these cameras. Okay. I just have a, a, a super clamp. So you've got a dozen of them that go all the way from ceiling to floor? Almost ceiling to floor. Right. They're, they're about 10 feet long. We have a 12 foot ceiling. Mm -hmm. So they stop a couple of feet above the floor. Right. Um, we don't necessarily need the cameras to go down two feet below the, uh, above the floor, but I wanted to give the option to do right. that. Okay. Plus, I had already cut 
several pieces of speed rail by hand. You didn't want to cut any more. So we just left. Free chop saw. You can actually. It's 10 feet. Uh, there you go. It's, yeah. Um, so this is the rig, a Mayfer clamp, right? And then did these adapters that go to baby pin, are those easily obtainable or where? Well, when I bought these, um, like the clamp, does it come with the camera or you had to get it, them completely separately? Okay. The, uh, the stud, the, the adapter here, that yeah. came with the clamp. Right. The adapter here, uh -huh. I ordered that separately, put them okay. together. I found, uh, through some trial and error, this was the most flexible way that I could find to put the cameras in any position I wanted. Mm -hmm. Because not only do I just need the cameras to be steady, right. I need to be able to aim them exactly right. where I want them. So, so even for motion capture, your camera does need pan tilt, not, not zoom obviously, but you do need pan and tilt I and do. not just physical X, Y positioning, right? Correct. Okay. So why I have this fitting on the end here mm -hmm. is so sometimes I want to mount yeah. them this way. Right, okay. Uh, so it's either usually this way right. or this way, depending on what kind of space um, I'm trying to uh, capture. Right. Um, the sensor inside is not is not symmetrical. It's not mm -hmm. square. So the aspect ratio of the sensor does make a difference right. in what kind of space I'm trying mm. to capture. And I'm usually trying to aim into the center of the volume. So there's some of this okay. swivel action going so on. So you too. need all the meticulous pan tilt. All I do. The, yeah. Now with the all the work is mostly done by your rig of the speed rail or something like that. You know, you, I, I would imagine you could use C-stands, but that's the same type of thing where you have some wobble, and the higher they go, the more they would wobble. Yes. Uh, right, so. On one shoot, uh, a remote shoot, mm -hmm. all of the cameras were suspended on, were mounted on C-stands. Right. And they were, they were extended up as high as they could go. Mm, trouble. Um, up to 12 or 13 feet, and there was some wobbling. Yeah. So we had... The that's, data was usable, yeah. but it was a little noisy. That's so, I mean, that's like the pinnacle of, of camera rigging is for permanent rigging. It's almost, you have to look at that as permanent. And everything else in the film industry is so temporary, you know, by nature that it's kind of like, ah, oh, bubble gum, gaff tape, you know, whatever it's going to put together. But, but then the evolution of that, I would say, is, um, you know, kind of the same concept. And I actually don't have the adapter, but I also use uh, Mafer clamps sometimes, but then okay. Cardellini. Is another great clamp, and I always travel with a Cardellini and a, and a Gobo head. And what I do is I put in there's a baby pin that will also go into. Uh, you could go directly into the Cardellini, or you can you can do different configurations, but it'll have essentially what's on there, which I imagine is that a quarter twenty thread in the bottom of the camera should be pretty standard. Pretty much any camera, DSLR or you know a little, uh, just in the actual base of the camera itself, yeah. it's probably quarter 20 thread, mm -hmm. which is standard across all cameras that I've ever Just come across in the smaller, in the smaller range, oh, yeah. which is a quarter inch pitch to the thread and then 20 threads per inch. And those are pretty readily available. And if anybody wanted to do their own camera rigging, one good thing to remember is if you go to the hardware store and you get your own quarter 20 threads of a bolt that you want to send through a tripod or something like that, if you lost the adapter, don't get the stainless ones. Get like grade five or grade eight bolts. So what happens with the stainless? Stainless, they, they give because they're a softer metal, which is the quality of stainless metal. So sometimes I've tightened the stainless and the threads will, the threads will strip quicker. So, Good to know. Yeah. But this, you know, this is kind of a bargain basement. I've actually put a, a baby pin in there and I've, I've rigged an entire DSLR on top of there. I've used these for GoPros. I've used these for even an EX-1 that I did a time lapse. It's all we had. So. I and just then you can travel with that this. to just about anything. Then. Yeah, exactly. And there, that's just it. This this has come and saved the day so many times. Uh, An evolution of this is actually well, you know, before we go into that, that's kind of uh, piggybacking on what you know. Any camera uh, here, you can pause on. There you go. That looks like quarter twenty thread right in the bottom of that. So, I know that the whole GoPro accessories and all those mounts, there's actually a quarter 20 mount that goes to the GoPro that right. I've used a lot. And uh, again, the DSLRs, any small camcorder. And in the tripod wedge plates that you get, there's like a larger and a smaller. Everyone always pulls out the larger okay. uh, thread that you tighten at the quarter. Right. That smaller one, that's the thread is quarter 20 pitch. So uh, those, it's pretty industry standard for everything. and. As you move up to any other kinds of cameras, um, what we did, 
is keeping in mind that we knew that was at the end of the quarter 20 and all that. Like here at Twit, across the way there, we actually took C stands, and I had to think of a way to rig 30 cameras in the ceiling. And this is a modified C stand that the base of it, they actually didn't have safety pins drilled into them. This is a C plus from Matthews. So that's, that's just the shaft of a standard C stand. And the end of it is basically the same size as a junior pin, which is industry standard as well. And these clamps were custom made by Matthews because this building is so old, we started measuring everything. And right. Our, so why were those custom made? A two by four nowadays is an inch and a half thick and three and a half inch long or deep. And these two by sixes, which are in the ceiling here, are actually two inch by six inch. And so you look up, and you're like, oh, that's two by six. And so I ordered these things from Matthews, and then none of them fit. And so we had to have them custom bend. And, but they were great. They were, they were so accommodating. But then I bought the rest of these C-stand bases. And for safety, had these machines so that a pin, a safety pin, could go through here. And this is very important if you're rigging 30 cameras over people's heads in a studio space where everybody's not exactly a rigging expert or, you know, it's just going to just move that camera and get it done. So all the rigs at Twit were designed first for safety and second for functionality. And these hangers would go over the, over the um, truss system of the roofing truss. And then you can tighten it down to pinch it in place. And then that gave you a stable position. And then you would insert the stand base upside down and insert a safety pin. And then that way, if someone accidentally loosened the top, it can't fall. There's no way for that to come out. So safety, number one for rigging any cameras. And we'd say that over and over and over. But at Twit, you'll look around there, and you'll just have this hanging down at about eye level all over the place. Right. And what it does is it gives you two lengths of risers, 14-foot ceilings over there. So we need to drop down. Each of these risers are about four, four and a half foot long, 40 inch, I believe, uh, three and a half. And this is a standard baby pin on the end. And this was just a perfect tool lying around the film industry, essentially, okay. because So then what goes on the end of the baby pin? Well, the other version is the grid clamps that go on. Uh, there's trussing going around everywhere as well. But the same design of safety up top with the pin. And this would go around two inch truss. And on the end, we have the same thing. So there's about 30 or 40 of these hanging everywhere. And on the other end, getting back to the quarter 20 conversation, these are these custom camera rigs that we built. And it's all based around inside the thread at this point down here. So this is a. This is a baby pin, same as what was on the bottom of those custom camera rigs that I made. So you have a baby pin. It's a 5 8 pin with a safety knurl in there. So that, the stand would be going up there, and this would click into, and actually, there's, that's a really long bolt. There's actually quite a few of these Cardellinis I've used instead of in lieu of the rigs, because they just go up really quickly. But you know, maybe that'll be clamped on a rig. And for this is kind of a kind of a Frankenstein setup, but this is what we had to do. So these just a nice consumer grade, simple, cheap little Canon G10, the Vixia HF G10 HF. Is that what it is? Yeah, HF right. well, G10. Well, it looks impressive. If I see you have your H HDMI to SDI adapter there. Yeah. Well, basically, it's all the camera, and then that little quarter twenty adapter we were just talking about is is right down in here, inside, and industry standard, of course, and it just goes into the bottom of the camera, but of course there's a series of washers and all these spacers that had to be perfect to clear. Uh, we call these the camera cages, and the, the top is a cheese plate, is what these plates are that have a bunch of holes in them. Ha ha, funny, or punny. But you have two, two cheese plates, and then you have these down rods that connect and give you a space to rig a camera and basically have protection for the camera, but have you something easier to grab onto and then I got these little Manfrotto ball heads because you can loosen them up and they can't fall out. Once you're safe and you're tightened up top and you got your safety up top as well, the way these ball mounts are manufactured, once it's put together with a you know, series of bolts and safety washers and stuff, this ball can't come out of this collar. So again, safety, most important thing for rigging things over people's heads, right? But this is the rig. And then we had these, these drop-down baskets were machined and made specifically to fit into the, the rods for each of the camera cages because we had to put in a Blackmagic converter box because the camera spits out HDMI that had to be converted to HD-SDI to go to the switcher. And so 
that little cable comes out, gets converted, and then we hook up an SDI cable that goes back to the, to the main router. And then there's, of course, the camera and the box had different voltages, so they both need their own transformer. And then there's all the guts and all the little bits. And so all that stuff needed to fit in a box. So we just said, let's just make custom boxes. So all that together, there's 30 of these, and there will be more uh, all over the Twit studio setup. And that was, that was, a, bit of a, was a bit of a design thing. There's just so many pieces. This is like building a little model, you know. But in the end, very functional. And when I walk through there, mm -hmm. I, I know they're all over, but I just don't notice them. They don't jump out at me. Until you hit they, one. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't it hit happens. one yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most of them are out of the way. But then the other thing we had to do was um, space-wise, uh, we actually, I didn't bring any of them over because they're all working right now, but there are versions of these cages where we put the ball mount on the bottom of the cheese plate. We kind of offset the basket had an available slot in the cheese plate. So the ball mounts on the bottom and the, um, the uh, receivers down on the bottom as well. Okay. And what we called them, I just started calling them stanchion mounts because they're similar to those stanchions that you have the velvet rope and stuff. Got it. The problem was the tripod with three legs taking up space. And you multiply that by, well, if we need 12 cameras on the ground, that's just so much floor space. So I bought steel plates. They were about quarter inch thick, circular 18 inch had them weld junior plates on there, hammer them flat. And then we just took, again, the Matthews C base, the C plus base, and that's a junior receiver. And so you have a steel plate, which would have been here. You have the junior receiver. The junior goes in there, tightens in place. And then this becomes the entire floor pattern. There's just no more floor space taken than just a C stand. You can walk right by it. There's no tripping. It's on a steel plate. And so there's about six of those around the studio as well. So not like, you know, you don't think camera rigging or replace a tripod or something like that. But at, that's camera rigging. And it was really important to save space in the floor. And if you ever see Twit behind the scenes, you'll see these look like C stands just sticking up out of the ground. But they're on a welded steel plate. And they're specifically designed to save space. And it works really, really well. It's solid. So. That's brilliant. Yeah, it worked out. Now, if anybody, if any of you have questions for Brent, uh, go to our feedback loop. Now, when you're watching uh, the stream, on frame right, you'll see instructions on the link to how to get to the feedback loop. Um, if you haven't been there before, you'll need to make an account and sign in, and then you can type your questions, and we'll see them here. If you see questions that you want to have answered quickly, uh, vote them up. If you um, Right. So I'll be answering the questions starting at the top of the question list, or Brent will be answering them. Certainly. So go there now. Why don't I queue up a couple images and we can talk about some standard film rigs. I mean, I was just looking through, transferred a couple images from an old phone, and uh, was looking through a couple, couple camera rigs that were pretty standard. But uh, one of the most standard rigs you can do for is just putting a camera on the ground, right? So we've, we've had all these rigs, and we're hanging, we're doing certain things. But uh, this type of rig is what's referred to as a hi hat. I don't know if you can kind of see this plate on the ground. It looks like a top hat. And this is a Mitchell plate, and this is an entire head. But this was the red camera, right? right about a couple of months after it started coming out and everyone started shooting with it. It's a music video we shot at the Vasquez Rocks where everyone's seen uh, Kirk and Spock run up that mountain. I have. Yeah, and this was some English, uh, I don't know what they, um, it was just bad music. <laughs> it was just some really bad, dancey kind of like, okay, listen to it over and over. And if I have to admit, yeah, if I was there, I'd be, I'd be recreating that running up the yeah, mountain. Yeah, exactly. So I'm glad it I'm was, not there. It was hot. It was really really hot too. But this camera, uh, is a, this mount is a pretty standard thing. You just stick a couple sandbags on the side of a rock and you throw a hi-hat down and you put a camera on the hi-hat and why would you want to lug a tripod or anything else up there? You already have the elevation for the, the, uh, the shot regardless. So it, this happens way more often than you'd think where you say just give me a blanket or they shoot from a sandbag or they hmm. shoot from, you would 
you would think, oh, yeah, I just shoot from the hip all the time and do whatever. But it is industry standard for everybody to say, just, just give me the camera. Let's just shoot now, especially if the sun's going down or things are happening or there's a great shot. And so even the highest of the high-end industry are always just like, now, just give it to me now. And you know, you just throw the camera at them and put on a sandbag and shoot. So uh, now this the next. the camera on the ground. Yeah. Well, another, since we're talking about GoPros, this was a fun one. And I wish I had the footage for this particular one. This was a shot where the director's like, I don't know, put the camera in crazy places. What about, like, can we see, like, the wheel spinning or, like, put it on? Can we put it on the wheel? And I was like. Sure, let's figure it out. And so we had some toys and we took a little mini version. It's actually a mini grip head and a mini version of the Cardellini that I just lost. Uh, I put it in the camera. So it's a teeny little mini Cardellini and a little mini head. And then we just got that quarter 20 um, GoPro mount. The same little thing, because the GoPro has a you right. know, quarter 20 mount. And screwed it in there and got the angle. And it's all about the Chevy bow tie, of course, and the badge. And so we framed the bow tie badge. And it was really tough because they didn't have the LCD backpack for the GoPro then. Right. So you'd pop the camera in the housing, you'd roll for a second, take it out, take it to the computer, download and look at it. You got to tilt up. And then you'd go back and you'd rig it. And it was monotonous to do all that. But when we got the good frame, then we said, okay, it's not like we're going to drive around town with this rig. Safety, of course, again, like that camera would just go flinging off at some point. But uh, I had to do tests and jack it up so that the clamp wasn't hitting the caliper. And so there's... Just to do this stupid little rig was like two hours of putting a GoPro camera. But the shot, I really wish I had it with me right now. I'll probably have to try and post it later or something. The shot is the whole world just spinning around and spinning around. And then we, we had a sandbag as a marker to stop the van when it was at the right spot. And so it comes up to construction. You just see the, the world spinning and spinning. And then, and then it's bam, right on this construction site, which was the whole theme of the thing. And you could actually see the tire bulging as, as it would get, you know, it would go from the top and then it would get to the street and bulge out. And it was you just blew my mind. <laughs> it was a cool one. That was all that director's call. And I was just like, oh, we'll try. And everyone's looking at like, where are you going to drive and do that? I'm not going to drive. We're going to, it was just funny because everyone thought we were going to go get that on the freeway or something. That is amazing. That shot, I really wish I had with <laughs> Okay, now yeah, I'm going to go do something dangerous with my car and my GoPro. Yeah. Uh, that, here we go. Here's another Yet again, another quarter 20 rig on, you know, this is a standard DSLR type of rig. And this was a, a lesson learned in shooting a bunch of DSLR type shoots and needing to rig the camera for steadiness, not only for locked off shots, but I used to really dislike these types of rigs where all the weight is forward and you have the camera, all the weight is there. And then sometimes, like in this case, they put a battery pack behind your shoulder to offset the weight. And they just, right. in my opinion, they just look dumb because, ah. I just don't like looking at the eyesore, but highly, extremely necessary. Because when you shoot from the hip, or when you just shoot handheld with a DSLR, right. the rolling shutter combined with uh, what's basically the nodal, the nodal point of the camera is... Right, and the nodal point of the camera is... Is directly right at the, the uh, basically the, the imager plane itself, or at the gate, right? And so, which, as the lens and other things all drift around that focal point where the the image is recorded, um, it's magnified by the rolling shutter as it scans down each, each image, you know, pixels at a time. The littlest bit of shake, and I was always used to shooting with EX1s, with stabilizers, and every video camera, camcorder, they're all been stabilized forever. And you don't think about it, because if you turn that off, which nobody ever does, you get this terrible shake in even CCD cameras, right? And with the DSLRs, like, Canon cameras at the 5D70, it is so magnified when you're just trying to shoot and say you want to walk and you want to, you want to shoot uh, as you're walking. I had a 14 millimeter uber wide lens that you would think would take the shake out of anything and it was unusable. It was actually really unfortunate because we didn't really look through the footage and say, yeah, we, because the lens was a prime, it didn't have a stabilizer. And many of other lenses that we were using did have stabilizers, so. So how does that mount uh, help stabilize the camera? What happens is all that weight is going forward, and especially in the case where you have the rock and roll or the, the two bar grips, 
Camcorders talk about this triangle of the golden triangle, they call it. So you grab the camcorder, put it to your eye, and it's like one, two, three points of stabilization. They talk about the golden triangle is what they call it, right? Or you jam your elbow into your side, and, and then you have this stability of three points. But it just, nobody, you can't shoot like this with your elbow jammed in there, and you can't do that for an extended period of time. This rig, with your two hands out at that point, you actually get more of a, of a squared stability point, and the camera's forward, and it can't pivot on its nodal point ah. because it's just sitting out forward. The pivot right. is basically your shoulder when you're doing something like this. So as you jiggle and shake this way, the pivot point's here, and your camera's far forward of the nodal point. So even with the prime, uh, which you know we had done a lot of shooting, and we didn't think about it until we had the problem. And uh, basically now, at all times, we have to shoot. <laughs> I shoot hmm. from a DSLR rig as, if I don't have a stabilizer. So by moving the camera forward, all the way forward, mm -hmm. you, you replace a lot of rotational motion mm -hmm. with more translation motion. Pretty much, yeah. Okay. It's ba it, it, turns into, it turns into kind of an XY shake rather than adding in rotational, you know, and, right. and uh, it was just bad, bad footage. You know, it was really unfortunate because that's, it's the combination of the rolling shutter and the, uh, and the nodal point of the imager that, that caused the issue. But so those are some of the rigs. Uh, one of the ones I did bring with me was this was for a concert we did in Detroit, and my job was to run around with DSLRs, and this is where this problem happened. And a lot of times we would go and rig this particular camera and suction cup, and uh, we were actually wondering if this would stick in place here on this grainy tabletop. Let's find out. I've, I have stuck my uh, GoPro suction cup. Uh, I think before. that's a no. It does not work. Well, it's temporary. It'll release in a second. So at, but, at your stadium shoot, what were you suctioning that to? That, as seen in this photo, was suctioned to a glass. There was a glass wall in a section of the of the box, and this is the uh, this is the actual suction cup stuck in place. And we had to clean the glass, we had to stick it in place, so I had to sit there and wait because directly below that glass, and this is on the inside of the glass, and the reason why I put up this other photo was because this down here where the cursor is is the glass in the stadium that we were putting it against. I don't know if it's very well seeable, but this was a little alcove, and so there's people everywhere. Just, there's 60,000 people come to this concert, and the director's expectation was, run around and get lots of shots all the time. And you're like, yeah, sure. You can't even move when there's 60,000 drinking people at a rock and roll concert. And it was so. And they're not standing still. Yeah. They're all moving around and yeah. bouncing into you. And so we had to go, we rigged a couple of these suction cups in place because we knew we didn't want to take, the, we, these were areas where we could just lock them off. And then I would remove the camera and then run as, as much as I could and then go mount it to the other place, which was hectic enough because the safety factor the, here it is right here, is you do a simple clove hitch, you do yeah. one loop in front and one loop behind, and I just slip it around the lens, bam. If it was going to break and fall off, then it's not falling on anybody. But um, And did you ever have a, a suction giveaway? No, I didn't. I did have a bad suction before I went on the trip, but I tested them before I left, and there was a teeny little sliver nick, and it just kept leaking. So, but. You know, I would have never done a simple rig like this with safety or anything like if it was actually rigged over people because just below there is three stories down to people in general seating and I would never have this camera rigged this cheesily over. But this, you know, if it would have fallen then it would have been inside the glass and Got it would it. have been, you know, two feet down to the concrete and smashed the lens off but that didn't happen and the safety was in place just for my own. So if you had needed to rig it on the other side of the glass, mm -hmm. Uh, what would you, what solutions you I would have brought have a done? whole lot more safety, and it's much more difficult. And I would have brought, I would have brought a safety for the, I would have brought a safety for the actual clamp itself. I would have brought a safety for the lens and the body, specifically getting into the where the handles for the, the um, camera are Got it. for the strap. And I would have also gaff taped the suction cup to the glass, wherever I had put it, or if I found painted metal 
Uh, I would have done all of those things and not shy of any of that. It's what I do whenever I do cars um, because a suction cup will give away and just tape will keep it from careening off and you know a moving car that's happened to us before where we've gone and driven around and and you get to where you're going and all of a sudden that this is loose but the tape it's interesting just the surface area being divided across there and as long as it wasn't too drastic of changes paper tape of course paper tape only on painted cars and nice things like that but if it was glass or something that could be cleaned I would do gaff tape and uh, not let it get warm because it would fail but so those were a couple rigs that were done live and that was a really challenging job because you're running up and down a stadium all day long and one of the other this was the 70 was rigged on the suction cups uh, the second night of the concert we had a tripod that we had to find a vantage point as high as possible and get the wide shot of the stadium which was the director's money shot he wanted that so bad and you're dealing with an angry crowd so I had to go up and we got a ratchet strap and we had a tripod and we went all the way up to the top and there's people just looking at you like you're not going to be there all night are you you know <laughs> and just getting a just getting evil eye from a bunch of people so you're like no of course not no we're going to be and so we looked and there was railings um, down the steps and so we went one set of railings down and then mounted the tripod held it against the railing and then ratchet strapped it in place there and I just had the camera PA just sit with us I said you just stand next to this thing the whole night and just wide shot and then you're gonna change ASA when the sun goes down and you know so but he said the whole time he's standing there and there's people just kinda in the beginning kinda mad dog and I'm like well, you, you, but they could still see the stage and so we had to specifically make sure we weren't making you know concert goers angry for that you particular want, you don't want to get the stink eye all night oh man it was it was hectic because people are having a good time at a rock and roll concert you know and uh, so that was uh, that's just kind of some basic rigs that I had found in my uh, my little collection okay. of of uh, pictures on on one camera phone okay well we, we have a collection of a couple of questions well, let's that start come in. answering some questions so um, you mentioned uh, the GoPro uh, mm -hmm. camera earlier. Yeah. Uh, what would be the most adventurous uh, uh, rigging you've had? You've done with the GoPro. That looked pretty adventurous. Adventurous. The to GoPro me. was a time lapse camera. Uh, word to the wise for the GoPro. Terrible, horrible. We hit. We just figured we'd try it. And of course, the GoPro is designed for close proximity, wide angle, lots of light. We did exactly the opposite for a nighttime concert show. We, we tried to use it for time lapses. In the day, it was OK. And I got a decent time lapse out of it where I just rigged it, watched the whole stadium fill up with super wide, nice. You could bend to the lens because it's such a wide angle for the, uh, the GoPro. It gives you nice, uh, you know, a nice wide, wide angle depending on um, which mode you choose. Right. 720 is actually wider. It's strange. But um, terrible, terrible camera, especially in the housing at night in a stadium because we just set it up and we had some wide shots and the port lens in the housing we all, I always use the housing as you know you're mounting something you check the frame even now that I have the little backpack um, LCD screen right put the camera in you frame it then I take the backpack off and close the lens once it's all locked off and it's just good to use the housing to frame your camera and then pull the camera out if you need to change cards or batteries and then it goes right back in the same frame Got it. but our subject matter was super wide and at night horrible for the GoPro and that dome port lens on the mount more reflections than the lens itself was already getting from all the stadium lighting and then all the concert lighting and it was bad but one of the cool ones is we put it on the mic stand of the of the artist very at the bottom of it and so um, aiming yeah up. just pointing straight up and I was guessing when I rigged it I'm like working with the guitar tech here's how you turn this on please make sure you turn this on like begging this guy in the middle of a concert to like go over and turn on the GoPro but he did it and we got the footage back and watched it and you just basically it's as if you're laying on the microphone stand and it's just kind of sticking up right here <laughs> that's the angle of view and so you're seeing the microphone stand right here and you're waiting and waiting and we were just scrubbing through this hour and a half two hours of footage and nothing's happening he didn't even pick up the mic stand but when he finally did grabs the mic stand he's swinging around it was a great shot right down the barrel of the thing and then he slams it down and he's doing his deal and he's but it was like 10 seconds maybe in two songs and 
and then the rest of the song you get great shots of the inside of the top of the stage of the lights and the <laughs> but, well it sounds like a worthy 10 seconds yeah though. but that wasn't the most the most extreme gopro one was that was that wheel the tire because of the the one that we saw before and shy of that we had it mounted in other places and was raining and we knew we'd get stuff blowing at the lens and we drove through the rain knowing that it would get all splattered and but the gopros they're they're great I've seen them rigged on skateboards, which is awesome shots. Just so much good stuff where it's just on the bottom of a skateboard looking as if you're underneath the deck of the board as you're going. Wow. There's a, there's a great YouTube clip of that. And GoPro, if you subscribe to their mailing order list uh, or their mailing email list, they uh, every week or so they send you like a shot of the day or the, or the clip of the day or the week or whatever it is. And there's some great stuff, really, really great stuff. That would get your wheels turning where you'd be like, I'm going to stick this on my cat or something like that. And I believe they uh, give away everything they own. They do. Every day. Is it every day? I think it's every day. Yeah. I so if you go to, if, if people were to GoPro. go there and sign yeah, up, yeah. That's a, there's a chance. It's a, but the, the purpose of that camera, we absolutely knew after trying this whole, because before we did some stuff on a Chevy commercial and it was, it was close shots and it was like, you know, stick it right on the, the car, the badge, and get the, the highlights going as you drive. You just stick it somewhere and drive. And it shakes a lot. The rolling camera shutter was an issue as well. It had a similar pivotal node issue and a rolling shutter itself, which that was really strange and should be aware that the, the rig, it's similar to this, the suction cup that comes with the GoPro. So if you imagine that this is the GoPro suction cup mount, you've got it here, and as you're driving a car, it's going like this, right? And that motion, just a little bit of jiggle, as we were driving the car, it was jiggling like this. And so we'd see the Chevy badge on the front of a Chevy or a GMC that we're doing the commercial for. And it's just jittering the whole time. And there's no way to stabilize it. There's nothing you can do because as the scanning is happening in the CMOS sensor, it's, it's in a different position when it starts at the top and when it gets to the bottom done with its scan because it's constantly moving really quickly. Right. And, and that is where the term yeah. rolling shutter comes from. Exactly. Yeah, so your camera with camera shake, essentially, without, stabiliz with a, without stabilization or a gyro or something like that, normal camera shake that you would get from walking or holding a camera, rigging it on a car, vibrations of, of wherever you put that camera are massively magnified by this rolling shutter issue. And it's, it's just, you hear about that stuff with red cameras in a helicopter, or you hear about them with certain other high-end cameras, and you figure, oh, GoPro's this little thing, and then... Ah, we got hit with rolling shutter issue. So, so why would camera manufacturers use a CMOS sensor, which scans the sensor sequentially, say from top to bottom, as opposed to a CCD sensor that just grabs the whole picture at once? Why would they do that? I believe it's a design. I actually, I, I've actually never known. I think it's a quality of the chip or just just design elements. I don't know why you would do it otherwise, but it, it definitely has been. It a, is cheaper. I believe cheaper, but a light sensitivity issue, I think, was the main uh -huh. reason why CMOS chips were or be gaining such popularity. Quality, imagery, and size, and things like that. Well, you get something, and you give something up. Yeah, yeah. But you can, that's why we're discussing rigging, is that these problems are real for everybody, even shooting a GoPro or a DSLR or, or a small camcorder. Um, rigging, you... This, this type of scenario with the suction cup on the GoPro, what we started doing is we took, again, we took cotton rope and then we tied it around and we, we wrenched down the little suction cup thing and then we would pull back at two other points and just pull back on that mount to it, so it had three, basically triangulating the rig. Mm -hmm. And it helped enough. And then we let some of the air out of the tires. This is something we also found out. These are like big vans. It was like a Chevy van commercial. So rigid suspensions and all the tires were pumped up. And so we lowered the pressure of the air in the tires to give a little softer ride. Hmm. And that actually helped. And that was an issue that when, when we move on to some other things, we'll, we'll talk about more of that camera shake that was always a problem with rigging these cameras in crazy places. So okay, maybe if we jumped ahead. Um, so while you're looking, uh, we mm -hmm. have another question. Uh, how important is it to consider a camera's weight and center of gravity when selecting an appropriate stabilization platform? That is to say, shoulder versus arm and vest, such as, say, the Steadicam Merlin. Mm -hmm. always, always matching the camera weight to, to the rig is going to, it's just going to be required for any type of Steadicam. Any type of Steadicam rig, there are absolutely wrong ranges or, you know, too much camera 
too much camera for a rig is a, is a big issue, and you'll just know. It'll be so lopsided if you try and over-rig something on, a, on a, some type of arm support rig, steady junior with too large of a camera, or too small of a camera on, on a large rig just requires so much more overcompensation. Sometimes you can't even get it to weight right because ah. any armature-based item, the, the armature itself has springs or other that are specifically meant to counteract the weight, the physical weight of the camera. So, so if the camera isn't heavy enough, yeah. the stabilization system exactly. won't engage at all. And then the solution is sandbags, like always. Ah. And they just hang them on there. You know? Sandbags. But then there's other rigs, uh, shoulder rigs. Weight is a really big issue. And a lot of times, a lot of times the shakiness of a lighter camera, you, if you just handhold a, a camcorder, that's their whole concept of golden triangle, why so many, and nobody ever shoots from the EVF, the viewfinder. Nobody does. And the flip outs are ubiquitous now. There was like half and half of cameras a couple years ago. Every camera's a flip out. Everybody shoots off of a flip out. I never look in the viewfinder when I'm shooting video. I'm always checking focus on the back of the LCD on the DSLRs because you have to, because focus is so critical with a large sensor. But even with the small sensor cameras, and the smaller the camera gets, there's, the smaller a camera is, the harder it is to hold still. You're always gonna get more apparent shake out of a handhold, or even in a rig with a smaller camera, because it physically, the, the mounting itself doesn't have the physical weight or you know, aided by gravity to, to it's just the more mass something has, the more gravity acts on it and stabilizes it. Or it's harder to stabilize, of course, but... Inertia is your friend. Yeah. It's just directly related to the size and weight and mass of a camera is going to be directly related to the rig and what's required and what result you're going to get once you're moving that camera. So, uh, Have you ever used the suction cup mount, say, in rain? Yeah, I did. We went to Madrid and I put... <laughs> this is a good story. I put a GoPro on... It was a Ford event, and um, Dvorak's like angrily driving this car around, and, and I'm his camera guy, and so I, and he's yelling at me because I'm taking all this time. This is John camera. Dvorak. John Dvorak, yeah. Oh, you got to get all this crap, you camera guys. And it was funny. He was giving me a hard time the whole time for fun. But So it was raining, and I had to rig a GoPro on the hood because we wanted to go and uh, get this one shot. And so covered in rain, and the little suction cup's not that great on the GoPro, so I wipe off as much water as possible to get it as dry as I can, but it's just coming down. So I got my sleeve and I'm just brush, 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 brush and stick as quick as I could. And got it in place and then I took cotton rope again and did a clove thing and I opened two doors and just, I was always rolling down windows and pinching the cotton rope in the windows or the doors or the hood. So in case the camera did break loose, again, it's not gonna go careening off or, you know, it was my only little GoPro, so. We went around and the, the gag was that they would drive this car and the car would hit a 10 foot diameter soccer ball and kick it into this goal. So Dvorak's driving and bam, hits the thing and then slams on the brakes and slides to a stop. The goal, the soccer ball goes into the goal and each of the journalists have to do this, right? Other journalist team has a GoPro as well and they saw my little rig and they're like, yeah, go stick it on the hood, get the same shot. So they just stuck it on the hood and the car drove around slams on the brakes, hit the soccer ball, and the soccer ball and the GoPro went into the, <laughs> into the net. And it, of course, the port lens on the little housing <laughs> right across, just ruined it, just ruined it. Completely scratched, didn't break it, but you know, they got the footage and I'm sure they got to watch it over and over if it just, you know. Well, unless they had yeah. a, other uh, replacement ports, that mm -hmm. was their one chance. Yeah. So I like to think that my first round was knowing to get most of the water out of the way as much as possible, not just trust it. Oh, water is like a sealing agent. Yeah, there's surface tension, but not for a suction cup. And that kind of cup wasn't the one where you push a button and suck out any air right. and create a vacuum. It's just uh, lick and stick. So um, again, the backup safety of the cotton rope was just double. Always double safety for your own gear and then for people around you. You know, even in that kind of scenario where someone's in a car, you never know where something's going to go. Any other questions for camera rigs right now? Yeah. We could well, the, uh, sure, we'll do one more. Um, what's the most unusual camera shot for which you've had to rig? Hmm. And if, has anything ever gone wrong? Yeah, it's actually something we're going to show you. Maybe we'll just jump right ahead to... This stuff gets really fun. There's a, there's a piece of equipment called a slider, right? And the slider is, uh, let me show you 
Let me show you one slider picture here. Uh, this one, you know, let me open these up in, uh, sorry. Let me open these up in something a little larger. The slider is a, an I-beam channel that's invented by this key grip named Jerry Giacalone that I work with actually pretty regularly. And Jerry, here's a picture of Jerry. Oh, you can't even see him. He's down here in the corner. Um, Hi, Jerry. Yeah. Oh, Jerry's in the dark. Jerry Giacalone has been a key grip for a long time, and he's, you know, key grips and grips are responsible for moving the camera as they, they operate the dolly. And the camera goes on the dolly, and you put the dolly on tracks, and it's a whole ordeal. And all the time, uh, you know, in 20 years of being on set, I see more dolly moves where there's a dolly grip or a key grip is at the, behind the dolly. You're rolling sound, and there's a DP who's got his eye in the lens, and they've got these little finger motions, and they say, you know, they're looking at the thing, and they say, oh, hell, a little forward, a little back. And they're always doing these little minutia mo moves. Or they'll say a little left or a little right, depending on how you're oriented with your camera. And what they're doing is they're just creating this little bit of a parallax drift. And it's been a tried and true, not trick, but just a filmmaking technique. It's just small, tasteful moves. And if you look at you know, what required for, um, this was on the, the white gold. Um, this was like a promo for white gold, the milk promo with the, uh, the rock singer white gold. And this is actually a DSLR rig on a three foot slider, a little one. And nowadays, DPs will use this, and it, Jerry invented the slider to be a way for you, you put the slider on top of a dolly, you put the dolly in the vicinity of the shot, and then you just let the DP or the camera operator just do their own move. They feel the moment. They're not depending on the communication lack because it's just too much to depend on a radio communication or whispering to somebody to give you precise movements in the moment. It's just something that camera operator or DP, you have to feel it. And you know, now that I've been operating this way for a number of years, it's just quintessential. It adds production value, and it allows you to reframe. It allows you to spice up something. You can be, you can, you know, pan off, and you can bring in the focus from fuzzy to clear as you're doing a little slide move, and then panning in as somebody described. You see it all the time in these emotional documentaries or uh, just. There's just good filmmaking that includes small, tasteful moves. And that requires very, especially with DSLRs that have large image sensors, film cameras that have large image sensors, and all the new cameras coming out, like an Epic uh, with a 5K sensor. All of these large sensors mean limited depth of field when you're shooting in low light or open stops, which everyone prefers to do, which means you always have a focus puller. And it's a whole symphony that has to come together. If you want to get this shot and you're using high-end cameras, um, and now so many cameras are getting larger and larger chips, and you know the, the DSLR is a great example because we shoot with these all the time, and it's really tough to operate them when you are put them on a slider of some sort, and you're also doing focus yourself because normally in the higher end film industry you have a focus puller whose job right. is strictly I you know they're the kind of people that can tell you oh that thing over there is four feet uh, 16 or four feet six inches away or that's that's 16 foot three inches away they know they look and they see and they think in dimensions and distances because their job is to look at the markings on the lens and just look at the judgment of the camera they're just constantly going like this and they're just that's their job and it's an it's a job that's been around forever because film has always required that shallow depth of field and that focal plane to track. And I do have a clip uh, that we'll see later that'll that'll kind of prove that point. But so as this is traveling along uh, the slider, mm -hmm. there is someone following it or whose arm is following it. Um, yeah, that the just focus as it goes. that just goes without saying. If you have a camera operator or a DP on a high end set with with a, a large uh, a large image sensor. Uh, and you have talent, you have marks, and you have all these things, you always have a focus puller. He's the first assistant cameraman, camera person. And the first AC generally changes lenses, deals with focus, and the second AC will go run and get the equipment and do that stuff. But uh, that's generally the minimum, is that you have a DP who may also be the operator. So you have a camera operator, a camera person, and a, and a first assistant who deals with only focus, because I do it all myself and all of us 
DSLR shooters do that all the time where we're just hunting focus, but that dictates the look of what we're recording. There's no way around it. If you're the only person, you're the only shooter, and you're operating a DSLR with a large sensor, and you're in a scenario where you're constantly changing subject to camera distance, or you're finding things and panning around that are in different focal planes, it dictates that the look of your story or you, the look of your project is going to have this hunt and hunt and find focus look, where it's like it's buzzed and then it's in. It's very Battlestar Galactica or very documentarian. You know, it, that's that's just it. It it requires you to end up with a documentarian look of hunt and peck focus. And if you want to have very specific, high-end, purposeful focal pushes, and, and they're all calculated, and it requires people to do that specifically. And I love shooting DSLRs with a documentarian look, but there's certain times you don't Time want that. Time and place for that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, uh, we talked about the GoPro a little bit ago, and most of the, most of the GoPro footage I see mm -hmm. on their site are uh, maybe a, a helmet cam of a skier or a surfboard camera from a surfer. Right. Uh, a type that I don't often see is the type you mentioned was time lapse using the GoPro. Mm -hmm. So, so you used the, the GoPro for time lapse. I did. It didn't work out so great because of the the subject matter we chose, which was a wide, empty stadium. There was nothing in the foreground, and then it became night for the nighttime concert. So how else would you do time lapse? It did lend us to start, um, well, if we back up really quick and we'll just reiterate how the slider in the past has been used. If we go through a couple pictures here. Great. Um, here is a slider being used. This is an InnoVision lens and uh, this is shooting some corn and this slider was used to slide across some, some kernels of corn. I think I have another angle of that same thing here. So here's the ear of corn up top, and here's the, in, the InnoVision lens is a long skinny lens that's as if you're able to bring something to your eye because it doesn't have a lot of matte box and things to obscure, so it lets you get close to small macro objects. And the slider was specifically used to bring that lens close to this kernel for like a Purina One commercial or something, or dog food. Of course, they love corn, apparently. Mm, yeah, corn. <laughs> and so this lens is right up in here and very critical focus. I think we we're shooting a couple hundred frames a second. Uh, not with this camera, but another same thing. But it gives you a perfect pan across a live piece of corn as somebody rotated the stick and the corn rotates and the camera comes across it. And it's just a small, minute move. No, re no need for a dolly. That's why Jerry invented this thing. And, and people have started to use this. Right now it's mounted on a dolly in this shot. Um, here's another shot where we did an Earth Day promo with uh, Joel McHale from Community is sitting out here. And here's the Earth, a guy in a costume. And the slider is being used to, wow, why does it keep rotating? The slider is being used here to just show the parallax of the wheat and barley in the foreground. And it's a beautiful, they only did maybe three feet of a slide, but it's a beautiful way to spice up a shot by just having the motion of the grass in front of you. That's, you know, definition of parallaxes and multiple objects in, in dimensions from one point of observation are moving in relation to each other. A lot easier to say parallax, right? Uh, other ways that the standard slider may be used. This is actually not the standard slider. This is one of the first times Jerry, and this is what's leading to the time lapse concepts, Jerry motorized the slider, right? And I don't know if you can see in the channel, it's pretty dark uh, by the monitor I'm seeing, but there's a gear, a tooth pin uh, rack here, which has teeth all along it. And then there's a geared motor on the other side of that. So what he did is he worked with a guy named Pablo who used to work in telescopes and precision motors that would give you right. repeatable actions, right? So obviously they're thinking motion control, right? And Well, who wouldn't? Exactly. And to, to juxtapose that, you know, so the standard slider is a manual, manual process by which, uh, you know, here's a decent shot of a teleprompter minus the camera, but... This is a manual eight-foot slider, and you and would just, you just operate it. Push it yourself. Exactly. And then this was, we were shooting kids this day, and the teleprompter was actually the, um, the kiddie cam or the uh, Interotron where the director's face is seen, and so it gets the kids' attention because they see the director's face in the teleprompter, and they can interview and interact with the kids. And, and so in this case, the DP needed to follow kids. So they needed eight-foot span and this thing on there, and so that was why it was invented. Then they motorize it, and Jerry meets Pablo, and, and then it 
becomes much more. And we start to think, okay, uh, it seems that we could potentially compete with uh, what used to be, well, it's still, it's still very widely used, but the Milo is this motion control, a ginormous motion control unit, right? Okay. And so um, I forget this, this guy's name, but he's been working with the Milo for a long time. But this is a giant track. These things are about a four inch diameter and they, have, uh, they also have a rack of gears down the track and the guide. But this whole unit is huge. It's, the, it's six or seven feet tall. The arm is, is probably 25 to 30 feet long. This is the small one. This is Milo 1. So and probably not the thing you'd want to be chasing kids around. Exactly, yeah. But the Milo gives you completely repeatable camera moves, and this is how you get into multi-layering and compositing of the cameras when, uh, uh, what's the Eddie Murphy movie when he's at dinner with himself in different costumes? The that one. The title escapes me. Yeah, that well, we, one, we've yes. all seen those films where, where multiple people are in the same scene with themselves. It's an obvious actor in an obvious costume, and that's part of the whole scene is that they shoot it multiple times, the camera, and this is, I just remember that movie because it's a move down the dinner table and then the same person is playing the character multiple times. So to do that, it requires a motion control pass. You do one pass with the actor sitting in one place, you do it again with them sitting elsewhere, then you roto, cut things out, and then layer them together so everyone's interacting with each other even though it's the same person, right? So that was how it was done and then all of a sudden Jerry motorizes a slider and uh, you know, I'd done, I'd done other versions where we had a motorized dolly track that was a little bit smaller than a Milo, but it's still like dolly track with gears, and it was still a big system. And uh, let me see here. Is this one of the ones? I'll just open up all of these and see if we can... Um, I'll close the movies till after, but... Jerry motorizes the slider, but it's non-precision in the beginning, right? And so what we did is we rigged the slider. Now, this is one of the more difficult by, ones. By non-precision, you mean it, it, you can't use it for a repeatable camera move uh, you like can. you would need for it? Yeah, you, you can for repeatable, but it was more difficult in certain scenarios. Like they're working on phasing, the, the, um, they're working on phasing it with the shutter of the camera for extremely precise Got repeats. Got it. Um, but yes, you would you would tell the slider to start here and end here, and it would repeat it over and over and be precise. Okay. But they're they're getting even more precise in the speeds and just constantly evolving. But this particular rig was on the back of a GMC for that Chevy GM commercial thing. This was a very tough physical rig. This is another rig on the front of a Chevy, and these were really difficult rigs because that particular one we're looking at right now would bottom out when we went in certain curves. We couldn't even get out of the parking lot. We had to drive up on blocks and and going around town. It was a little hectic, but the results were, were really awesome. Uh, this particular one uh, with the white Chevy van and the chrome badge in the front, uh, that's one that we'll look at in a second. And then this particular one where we put the slider inside for the, the IP shot, which is uh, the instrument panel. Um, the director was all worried, and this is the lighting setup for it. Really simple, large lights in both sides, and it was a uh, large light into a rag, but then you go inside, and I'll go to the movie versions of those. Um, this was this is a nice one because this is the this is the instrument panel version, and that's what the slider was initially made to do. Great close close quarter shots like that. If I play again, it's just a simple, super crisp. This was shot on an Arri Alexa right when it came out, and the image when you see this full 2K is beautiful. And before the slider, how would they have tackled that shot? It would have been a buck, which is a car where you cut pieces off of it. You cut the roof off, or you cut the windows out. When you when you go on a car commercial, there's a buck, or there's multiple bucks, and they're like they're these cars. Like I did a BMW thing, and. Uh, they cut up all these brand new M5s, and on the outside of them are these like nasty welding tabs with Zeus fasteners and things, and they would just unscrew stuff and lift the whole quarter panel off or something, and then be like, we're going to shoot here. And the buck is like this modular, just butchered car, but with the slider, we, we put it across the seats, you put it in, uh, you can go through a window, you just, you could 
do all kinds of interesting shots with these types of tools. So not so much, I mean, this is where we start to get in the realm of, yes, this was used on a, on a GM commercial for a high-end, you know, fleet, um, fleet advertisement spot. But these types of tools are the kind of things where, you know, people out in, in the audience of Pixel Core can start to say, I could use this tool with a DSLR to can create a really amazing move for something that these are about upping the production value of your content. And that's just kind of right. my whole MO is to say, hey, let's, let's all up the content and the, the production value. And uh, tools like this really make that difference because this slider with this stabilize of a move, when you're dealing with things like rolling shutter and, and these tools are built to deal with those types of camera shake and those things that are prevalent everywhere. And like we discussed earlier, it's not just GoPros and DSLRs. You know, these problems are inherent for even the most high-end stuff. So it's kind of a blurred line between what, um, you know, we, we see a little bit of camera shake. Here's the uh, badge version, and I'll, I'll loop this one so it goes a couple times because it's short. But this is the, uh, this is the live action, You're driving down San Diego Street, and this is the slider, you got all this chrome everywhere. And uh, that rig that we just saw mounted, it's a little bit bouncy. If you really watch the 2K version of this, you would see that the badge and the grill have a little bit of, of rolling shutter flutter to them. Uh, you probably wouldn't be able to be notice that in the stream. And on top of that, this was a full sky replacement because we went to San Diego for the sun and the blue weather. That's all I did that in post because the sky was blown out and it was a total road of nightmare. But wow. Um, yeah, the chrome was especially difficult. But luckily, it was completely blown out, and I just had nice white things and uh, just did some replacements. But um, it looks great. So things like that are, you know, I was hired to come as second camera on a national uh, commercial spot because I started to shoot alternative things, started shooting with a DSLR, shooting with a slider, shooting with a motorized slider that's mounted outside of something. And the conversation went something like, yeah, we're going to shoot Chevy vans and we want to make a vans look beautiful and sexy and cool. And I was like, well, why don't we make a really awesome moving shot outside? And they were like, love the idea, let's do it. So Jerry, uh, Jerry set me up with all the all the good stuff, and and you got to make bring something to a project that everyone's just like, oh, Chevy vans, well, yeah, we'll sell them to the fleets and the commercial dealers, and they got excited about this spot because we shot all these really interesting angles of their of their vans and made them look like they'd never seen them before. So this is the whole my whole mo is say let's take high end film and apply it to new media because even though I was on a national commercial car spot, it was only through who I knew and talked the, talk the talk of, hey, let's really push the envelope here and give them something that, that we can do and within your budget. That's the key. So it was like, give you something really spectacular within your budget was, was what that allowed. And it sounded like having the option of, of, of the slider um, mm -hmm. gives you a little more leeway when you have to uh, come up with a solution creatively just on the spur of the moment. Yeah. That was, well, the spur of the moment thing was, it's, you're kind of committing from the get-go because there's so much involved, but the, the spur of the moment was where you pick your angle and where you drive and all those things are still definitely apply. But um, I think we also had another couple. Well, see, that's the motorized, right? So first we had the manual slider, and then there's motorized versions, and I think we should probably speed up so we can actually get to showing you a slider that I brought. But I was fortunate enough to go around with Joe Lindsay quite a bit and uh, the sales force has been hiring us to do time lapses for them. But again, throwing the gauntlet, we're like, let's give you motion time lapses because the slider, the motorized version, you set uh, an end point and a beginning point. You tell it to go across. And so I was bringing the six foot slider all over the place and Joe and I are lugging this thing to places that, uh, you know, it was, it was not easy to get to. Uh, so then while your camera is taking a sequence of frames, mm -hmm. it's traveling along the slider. Does, does the slider stop uh, when it takes a picture, or does it just keep going as it's exposing its The its slider, the slider does say, stop, so the, and it does, 
in time-lapse mode, in, in normal motorized mode, it has a slow, easy ease ramping up, and then it goes, and then it slows to a nice smooth stop if it's programmed correctly. And when you do the time lapse, it pretty much just goes. But the idea is that you're doing a time lapse, and time lapse is all about moving in organic elements, clouds, or water, or people, or traffic, you know, non organic things as well, but it's movement. Time lapse is about analyzing movement in a way the human eye can't perceive it by taking snippets in time and then crunching them together. You're deleting moments of time, right? Right. So we lugged this slider to the top of, um, what's this point called? I don't know what the top of this point is. I don't know what the top of that point is. Above Sausalito. It's, it's where everybody goes to get a picture exactly, of the Golden, the Golden Gate. Gate. Right and so we, we said we want to shoot time lapse of, uh, I think Joe shot this obviously because it was just the two of us up there, but I don't know if you can clearly see the slider and the traffic was one element. And, and in something like this, you want a, a time lapse here with a wide angle lens is not going to be very dramatic with seeing the traffic and the boats go by as much as we wanted to add the element of parallax movement. And so that's the thing with something like this, really wide shot. Parallax movement is tough, so you need foreground elements. Even better if you have mid ground or, or you know, multiple mid ground elements. But I'll show you the result of this particular one. But uh, this, basically, the, the grass in the foreground becomes a subject of movement. And so what we do is we set up the camera and we frame it accordingly so that we've got, this is the black and white version that Joe did that's probably a little more pleasant to look at than the other. It has more of the foreground included in it. But get that out of the way of the foreground. So this, if you can see, uh, it looks pretty dark on the, I don't know if it's coming through on the stream, but in this case, everything's super wide. We're getting a time lapse. The bridge and the city behind it are not going to move, but this is about seeing the foreground of, of, the, of a nice smooth dolly move while a time lapse right. is happening. So this is kind of the beginning of this quality of something new and interesting. And uh, it's much more apparent, like uh, Kenji Kato and I went down to, um, to Fort Point on the other side of the bridge, and then we got, we got kind of fogged out. But we dragged the slider down there and tried to do something similar by putting it in the ground. But obviously, the fog rolled in immediately. And it's just like, San Francisco, it just gets you every time. But we went back another time, Joe and I, and uh, we did a different version of that same place. And this one was pretty interesting because we decided to use the chain as a foreground element. Because again, we're dealing with this, we're on the other side of this bridge and we're dealing with this crazy spans. But so this chain, beautiful chain thing in the foreground becomes um, a subject. I probably should have loaded the daytime version of this. This is kind of the nightish one. But the, um, so you start, is, you, cool. you start to think in some dimensions where instead of looking around and thinking, oh, clouds and this and people going by, whatever's going to happen, you start to think in parallax and in dimensions, and you say, OK, we want to arrange things in the foreground because it's so much more dramatic. The, the pinnacle one that Joe and I did was um, this one was great. There's the two of us just when we're about to do this. And I was telling you this story the other day. So we dragged the slider down just outside the PixCore office, the old office, on Market and Forth. And we so started you're running screen. it. And We're on the street, and this is a, a really big, well, we had or, two, or I mean, two stands with rollers right. and a cart and the battery and the control unit for the slider. And, and Joe's like, oh, man, we're going to get thrown out of here. They're, everyone gets thrown out for shooting stuff. Because <laughs> so, in San Francisco, if yeah. you put sticks on the ground, yeah. you need a permit. Exa oh, really? That's the rule? I didn't even know that. Oh, I'm not yeah. a lawyer. I don't even <laughs> okay. play one on TV, so. Well, we, uh, we decided to, to explain to the officer that, because uh, a lot of times we'll run two cameras at the same time in the slide with two different angles. And so I said, the uh, officer came up, started sweating us, and I was like, well, you see, sir, what's happening here is these two cameras are uh, pointed with different angles of lens, and they're looking at the same environment. And as we slide from one end to the other across this thing, it's analyzing the parallax difference between the two cameras. And if you put this in the computer and you analyze those two against each other, the juxtaposition should give us calculations of triangulation theory that will allow the computer to redraw all these buildings. And I'm totally making this up. <laughs> and the it's guy so in the officer was work. just like, 
you got 10 minutes. Like, Thank you very much. And so we finished. We only, we only got 10 minutes. We wanted to do a 20-minute push. But ironically, I told you that story because I told you that. And you said, that might be possible. Actually, I was just making it up that two camera angles across something could theoretically. Well, th there is a ring of, of, of truth in there. And, and Wouldn't when, that be funny if that was absolutely possible? When you get parallax, when you can record parallax, yeah. there are a lot of things you can tell about the scene. Well, this was the end result of that one, and this is our, this is our favorite. Because the parallax here, uh, you have time lapse in the sky. You have these, the wires in the foreground. You have the blur of the cars and the people and the trolleys. And, and I really wish we could have run this one longer. It's, this is the shortest clip we got, but the most dramatic, and I really, really like this one. This, this changes the way you start to shoot things like time lapse, where uh, we've, you just start walking around, and then you start doing things like you, you look at, you stand at a corner, and you start kind of moving like this, and you're just like closing one eye, and you're thinking, this would be a really good parallax shot. And it just gets, you start thinking differently when you get to do interesting things like this. I think especially for, for that shot, everyone has stood on a street corner yeah. and had, had, yeah. had traffic go by. Mm -hmm. But what you've done is you've unlocked another sense of reality, another dimension for them for the same situation. Yeah. It looks completely different. It's mm -hmm. a new way to experience that. It is fun because you know, starting to shoot and doing longer exposures with the DSLR allowed you to shoot time lapse. And then, of course, you can open, have the shutter stay open for a while. So then you load up a bunch of NDs, and then you're starting to deal with NDs in the camera, and then you're opening the shutter, and you can streak people, and you can streak water or cars or things. And then, but the added motion of it's just layering on things and adding, adding content, uh, just upgrading the quality of the content has, has been the focus of all these, these projects. So in the vein of what can you do yourself, um, Joe uh, was not able to come up and join us, but he actually purchased a, 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 a is it Kessler, I believe, makes a smaller version. There's a lot of people that knock off the slider. And I actually brought one of the original sliders up oh, here. Oh, great. And what I think we'll do is we'll just kind of show the video version just so we can actually cut to the camera version of that. Okay. And I got all the pieces over here. And so what we'll do is the cool thing that they did was at the slider is that they, they knew that all of us have like a standard Manfrotto um, tripod, right? right? With a 75 millimeter ball mount and they all have this 3 8 thread. And so these two items to make this slidable was kind of one of the, the things that they worked on. Because outside of the high-end film industry, um, most of us are dealing with a DSLR or a, a video camera that's going to go onto a small video head or something like this, right? Right. So the slider came up with a mount. Now this is the, uh, this is the three foot mini slider. And this is a beauty. This is just the greatest machine work. There's a little stop break back here that some of the other ones don't have on the bigger. They have a different type one. But when you rig it, you just get this perfectly smooth action. And the engineering on this is phenomenal. Just the machine work and the, the powder coating, the feel of this. And the larger ones are even more impressive because they're just big and giant and high, yeah. high quality company. But what they've done is they've looked at the video market and they've said, hey, let's give a mount for a 75 millimeter standard tripod. So it's just standard 75 millimeter ball mount, goes right in. And there we go, with 100 threads to go. But you would just look at it, and you could either have a bubble level on your head where you could level this later, or we're just going to eyeball it right now. And you would want to make sure, first of all, that your, that your tripod is flat and level. Is this the largest slider you would Not consider putting at all. on this that particular tripod? This is the smallest tripod? slider. Um, this is the largest I would probably put on that tripod and with that ball adapt, but there are larger three-foot versions. There's a four-foot version, a six-foot version, an eight-foot. Then they also took their six-foot versions, and this is the smaller channel six-foot version. There's a version that's motorized where they made a 36-foot belt, so you can stack as many up to 36 feet long or 30 or 24 or 18 Huge. or any derivatives of six. And you put this belt through there, and it's, it's, it's impressive. It's really, really impressive. 
So this is the mini slider, and you've called this a smaller channel. Uh, what other size yeah, there's channel a, is there? There's a fatter channel, which is for the standard uh, larger film cameras that have a full uh -huh. Mitchell plate mount, and they require just a larger mass and physical structure. But they've also machined all these bits and pieces. This is a Mitchell adapter plate, and this is a standard Mitchell mount. And they give you an adapter, and you can either put a 100, 100 mil ball or the adapter for the 75 mil ball. And then you can take your own video head and drop it right in there. So on this size slider, with that tripod and that head, uh -huh. how heavy of a camera would you put on there? And still have it be stable and not wreck oh, your this, head. This could take this could take twenty pounds. I mean, depending on your sticks, but you could, you know, you could put something the size of a nine fifty on on here as long as your sticks were rated for something that that, that was that heavy. Like how much, so how the, heavy the limiting is that? factor is is not necessarily the slider in this case. It's it's the head and the sticks. Yeah, it's more the head and it's it's mounts that are below that. But you know, this specific three foot mini slider. It's great for any DSLRs, any camcorders, anything in the five pound range, something like that. Um, what we're going to put on it right now is, I'm tightening all this stuff up. So now I have a sliding platform for full pan and tilt ability, as well as a little parallax slide. And if I mount my camera on there, Here's a little EX1, and if, if all we wanted to do was frame a shot, even from here, we could pop in a little bit, and even in, this is just a three foot move, and it's actually reduced by the amount of the distance on the, each of the end because of the plate itself. So we're going to move about two and a half feet, and just that little bit of movement on the tabletop you will see. Classy. Yeah. Now, why would you, why, there's many reasons why you would do this, not, not for being just because it's cool, but if we had an assistant, Liana is available, and here is your chair. Let's say we wanted to make, here, if you just have a seat and face Kevin, yeah. And, uh, I don't know, we can make up a story. This is a detective thing, or this is a job interview, or we're not sure. Uh, there are many reasons why you would do this type of move, but the, what we're talking about here is the fact that we can do this type of move. And if we wanted to punch in a little bit more, we wanted to grab some focus on Kevin. You're hired. Ooh, hired, that's good. And then we drift out here. So now we can just do a nice reveal. We're behind. Maybe it's uh, something dramatic about the thing that's on the table. And uh, as we move the camera, look at that. This is great. And then your line is that she's hired or fired. We don't know. Can you start tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, there you go. So we can go the reverse, and we can, we can bury a move uh, you know, for mystery and put something in. And we can do the reverses and cut. But really what is more useful about this is I don't know what we just lost. The usefulness of that is limitless. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Stanley. But the concept is simple. You can, you can use it to your imagination's end to decide why you would do these things. But what I have I've seen over and over and over, and what we, we just we try and shoot from sliding devices as much as possible because it is just a tasteful way to improve the production value of almost anything. It's just, it's really phenomenal how many places it's appropriate just to slide a little bit. And, and it's so small. Great. It's, yeah. it just, you can put it anywhere. Mm -hmm. it's a, it looks like it, it just packs a big punch with just that little piece of gear. It really does. I, I love operating off of a slider. You can, you can do it handheld. You can do all these things handheld like we talked about, but it's just... It's just less preferred. That's the thing about, another thing about the nodal point of a camera is that it knows. When, you can see when things are moving on a perfectly machined line. You don't notice it, but the eye 
equates that to quality when it can see that this that there's a camera is tracking along an extremely linear um, tracking path. Smooth. Yeah. Mm. These are these these are these qualities that equate to uh, mm. production value and quality in the mind of the viewer. And so using tools like this instead, of course, I could hold this and I could hand hold and I could do I could do a little drift across and that's not going to give me any camera shake or anything bad. But the little bit of drift that is going to happen. And yes, I could stabilize that in software. I could do all kinds of things, but we always say in the film industry, ev do everything you can in camera because fix it in post is, is just the it last more draw. Expensive. Yeah. And it's more expensive, and you, the more you can do in camera. This tool, the slider, has been uh, moving forward and backward, moving laterally. You can do on inclines. You can take these things and rig them upside down and have your camera uh, be suspended as well looking down. There's, it's all machined to go any way you like. We even took the slider and we did the motorized slider with this camera and this rig, not the suction cup, but this mount was screwed to a, a uh, slider that we did vertical. And so the weight of the camera was such that it was no problem for the motor to do a vertical elevation rise just straight up hmm. as the camera was looking over a banister and we just did a reveal of a crowd somewhere. And uh, that was in time lapse, of course. We could have shot video, and we could have done the same thing. So it sounds like the slider doesn't necessarily, in, in addition to adding motion, what it seems to me, what the slider's doing is, where you could do a move by hand, mm -hmm. the slider lets you throw away the motion you don't want and just choose just that one motion you do want. Mm -hmm. And there just seems to be something um, uh, special or uh, uh, almost profound about mm. just a nice smooth motion yeah. on one axis with no other And another key is repeatable. When it's important that you are able to do repeatable takes, having the camera on some type of support that allows you to just repeat a beautiful shot over and over, that's part of filmmaking is that you're going to do it over and over and over. Uh, or you just need to roll with it. By the same token, if you're if there is no do-over and you're in a live interview with a high-profile client and you just need to get that shot, it's going to add to that moment so much more than just plunking down a static camera. So the, um, the advantageous qualities of, of, of just considering a small two-foot slide are, are pretty, it's pretty amazing, the amount of stuff that we get repeatedly over and over and over. Well, it looks great. Ready for a couple of questions? Yes. Let's okay. some questions. So, uh, next one, uh, rigging for 2D versus 3D. What are the differences and challenges between rigging for 3D versus 2D shots? There are, I was actually going to pull up a picture of a small slider with a 3D rig. If, and there we go. And so, by, by the question, I'm assuming the person means stereoscopic versus 2D. So, the... Um, and the question is moving the camera with those types of rigs? This, um, this photo is actually of a, this is a beam splitter. This is a 3D factory beam splitter that's on a slider. So, I'm sorry, was, was the question specifically about moving the camera 2D versus 3D or was it? Um, sure. Yeah. And once, rigging, once, sure. you've, once you've built the rigs, I mean, that's the thing, is that this is a 3D rig that we're looking at right here in this, in this image. And the, this is two red cameras that are into a beam splitter. There's one, there's one vertical above. There's one looking straight through the silvered mirror. And the rigging itself is always required for a 3D rig. You're either doing side by or you're doing uh, through a beam splitter. And so this entire rig is a self-contained deal, and I watched the, the guys build this uh, the day that we used for like a Yogi Bear movie promo or something. And then they just stuck the whole thing on an O'Connor head and put it on a slider. The exact, this is the larger 3D or three foot slider. But the rigging, of course, for 3D is much more involved. So basically that's a self-contained unit. Got it. Beam splitter or other, it all, that gets done first. And then that unit, most of the time, there are designs to allow that entire arrangement to then be put on a crane or a housing uh, to even go underwater. You know, there's all 
there's all types of things, but it all starts from building the base around the beam splitter um, and then aligning the cameras or, or offlining them. Uh, then the entire thing gets put into secondary movement rig. More often on a dolly, uh, very often on a slider, and it works just the same. Because once you've done the work of lining up your 3D cameras, there you go. But it, of course, takes so much more time. So 2D versus 3D in that scenario, of course, you got way, way, way quicker for 2D for everything just because of the setup. Okay. Have you ever uh, rigged a shoot in, in a, a forest canopy situation or in a jungle where it's humid? A forest canopy, w the rain in San Diego was killing us. Yeah, that was, it was more in the open elements, but we were, we were in some nooks and crannies and you know, you go to San Diego for sun and it rained for three days straight. And uh, the forest canopy we encountered was the rain in San Diego, which was in downtown San Diego, but it was a bank of trees along a side and, and just dealing with rain. And the elements are always there. You're always gonna be shooting outside, but in the actual forest, oh, this was one of the shoots, this Yogi Bear shoot was, uh, that was at a lake and we were in the woods and you're down in the reeds and you're, yeah, you're just always in the elements. The, the good shot is always off the beaten path. So looking when you're at rigging the path. for moisture, uh, mm -hmm. what do you do? When you're rigging for moisture, you plasticize everything. You bring tents everywhere you can. You uh, use housings if you can, but usually it's not available. You didn't have the forethought to do that. So. In uh, the San Diego shoot with these DSLRs, I was leaning out a window with a box of Kim wipes in the dash, and I was we were doing uh, different hostess tray rigs, or we would just pull over constantly. There are rigs, if you have the forethought and the money to do them, there are ways to rig things to the front of the camera. You would plasticize or you would waterproof the camera itself. And then for the lens, you can theoretically shoot directly into rain, or you could have somebody spray a hose right at a camera. There are uh, air jets and fans that will blow anything away from the lens, including rain, but expensive. Uh, they're often AC powered, not just battery powered. They don't travel well. There's a whole setup and you have to have the forethought that it's going to rain or you're going to need that shot. And so it's just so rare when you're like, oh, of course, we really need one of those wind scrollers to blow the rain out of our lens. And you never have them. I just I've only seen it the one time that we did a show where we were in a forest and we looked straight up and rain was coming straight down on the lens and they just, it was a great, beautiful shot. You know, you're looking straight up into the rain and some trees and the water's coming down and just it just kind of disappears. But those were fans that were just high powered fans blowing all the, the uh, leaves away, yeah. Next person asks about uh, dolly and rail solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the different types of dolly on rail solutions? say, f uh, flexible curved versus linear straight rails? Mm -hmm. uh, this dollying has been a standard for a long time. There's a lot of evolution of dollies where there are a couple companies that make kind of really thick plastic bend your own track. Uh, we viewed it for the, uh, for the, the uh, Porta Jib. Right, uh, from Laws Mandy. Uh-huh. Yes. And there are some other companies doing the same where you just have, you just carry this giant this giant tube, really dense, thick, heavy, filled up tube. That's the tough part is transporting that because it, it's as, when you roll it up, it's about as large as this table. It's around right. and it's about three, three or four thick. But you lay it down and then your track has movable legs that kind of just conform to that irregular shape of track. The uh, classic way is to use actual track. And I believe I had some shots of some track as well. Yes. Please. The, uh, that large motion control rig? Uh, this was actually a different shoot. This was a blue screen shoot through um, some windows of a supposed air traffic controller tower. And there's some track down, some curved track down in the bottom corner here. Um, there's a green screen shoot where we had some curved track. And the reason why I put these in here is because you see the tracking markers on the wall itself. When you do something like this and you move the camera against green, you have to have a reference on the green itself for the parallax. Parallax exists in virtual as well, as you know, for set So that your virtual camera can match exactly what the camera, the yeah. real camera did. So if you just rolled around, like these people, we did a semicircular roll around the, the uh, subjects in the foreground. 
And without something moving in the background as well, there's no way for you to actually digitally stick your background in place to make it look realistic. Otherwise, you're guessing very difficult to do. And nowadays, there's, of course, software that can analyze the camera movement for you. Right. It, right. it does need yeah. those markers to, uh, yeah. to figure that out. And so that's, that's, some, uh, that's some hard track. That's just standard. Uh, I believe that's a Fisher's actual rounded track. That's a Fisher 10 dolly. Was that a little 11? That's the little Fisher 11. And the skateboard wheels are pretty standard. And what happens is everybody used to take their dolly and put it right on the track. And the dolly, the actual wheels would roll on the track. And Fisher had square track and Chapman had round track. And then uh, a couple key, well, a key group, I forget his name, invented the skateboard dolly concept where they put multiple wheels in a trough and then the dolly would sit in these troughs and because you have multiple wheels riding on the surface where the joints are in the track you would feel less bumps because those the one seam is basically amortized across five wheels per four so you don't get a th -th, which is seen in the camera you know you'd see all this big giant dolly and all these things and you'd look in the lens and, and if you ever got to ride on a dolly with a high-end film camera looking through the lens and you had the teeniest little bump it's like the princess and the pea syndrome type thing where you'd see like a little th -th, and you would see it. It just all gets magnified by the size of the imager and, and uh, you'd think all this big, huge film equipment's not sensitive to a little, little bump in the track, but they are. Basically, the skateboard wheels completely negated all those issues and, and a lot of times you'll just, won't even level track anymore. People just put track down. I mean, like you see here in the green screen shot, there's uh, like one wedge over here. There's one wedge to level out that one piece of track that was maybe sticking up a bunch. And if we go back to the other shot, this is probably a much worse off floor. And he's using skateboard wheels as well, but there's a whole bunch of wedges. Of course, that's also determining the floor or the level of I time see. and whether the grips even want to bother leveling track. But So for track, that's the thing. Because when you use hard track, you're, you're used to level all the time. A lot of people will just lay it down and put the track on, but you have the bump factor. So then you're going to rent some troughs to put the dolly into that can lessen that if it's really critical. Or do you even need all that stuff? Do you need to have a smooth booming action? Do you need a full dolly with a hydraulic boom? Or do you do something like a small jimmy jib, um, ported jib or something that's just on a smaller track? And, and does the arm, is it, is it a jib arm that's going to take out a little bit of the bump? Or There's a lot of factors that go with that, but it's just more gear. And there are cheaper ways. You can absolutely take a skateboard and put it on a tabletop and stick up you know, some type of mount or drill this instead of a suction cup. I could mount this into a skateboard and you can do moves with found things. You can sit on a skateboard. People do dolly moves in with wheelchairs all the time and they're great moves. They're very versatile. They can go anywhere. So moving the camera if you know in an office chair, this is a great dolly to just especially on this floor, it's all soft. I would I would no problem do something like a slider move if I was holding a camera here. But, if, you know, I'm fighting the wheels already, so it's like we, we know how smooth this is going to be if I can't sure. really yes. reset. And it's is what we just talked about with, with even just a little bit of, it's going to feel handheld. So that's ultimately the decision on what you use. How high-end is your shot? How high-end, what are the expectations of your client? Or are you really trying to make something extremely well done? If you're telling, if you're putting all this money and time and effort into telling a story or selling a product, then you, you choose your battles where you're going to skimp or not. But right. if you're putting a whole bunch of money into everything except, and then you're going to handhold the camera, it's, you might get a less desirable look in the end. Got it. You know. Our next viewer asks about, uh, he wants to know about the range of motion when using a Milo. Uh, does it slide and, and They're pretty uh, impressive. And, the Milo's, Everything. the bigger ones, yeah. What the Milo does is it has a track, right? And so the track has a lateral movement, and then the Milo is like a big dolly, and then on the, on the the base of that dolly has full rotation itself, and then it has a full armature as well. And then on the arm, there's certain heads you can install that have full pan and tilt and Z rotation access. And what I've seen them do with Milo's before, this is really impressive. I've seen them. So let's imagine this is rigged in a Milo, right? And this is the scene where it's looking right at you. And I've seen these guys do it all the time to show off, or I don't know if it's like resetting, but imagine you have an entire rig, an over-rigged deal where there's the pan head and there's the arm coming up here and the Milo's on the ground next to us. 
and there's track that goes off this way. I've seen them do many times where the Milo will reset itself. It will move forward, the arm will go up, the, the head will, will rotate and do whatever it needs to do, and the weirdest thing is the camera will not move, not a bit. It won't, it's just perfectly locked in place, and the entire rig is moving to reset itself. And sometimes they'll do that. I think it might even be, I don't know, it's probably a button where they say just lock camera in place, and then you can do any functions you want, and the, the rig will compensate. So these are obviously wow. the highest of the high-end stuff, but it's so cool to watch because you're, you're looking at this camera, and it's just, and then the, everything's all, and the monster's moving over like this, and the arm is extending because the head unit can, it can scroll along the actual right. armature as well. Uh, it goes along as if it's telescopic, or telescopic um, cranes or these new ones that actually come out, but it's impressive, but expensive. Really, really high-end stuff. So range of motion, so yeah. infinite. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much infinite. And what we did when we, the pictures I showed you is from a Kleenex commercial. We went from, we went from one set to the other, and the camera, I think it even did a rotation or something. But basically, we had two lighting setups, and we moved the lights during the setup so that it went from morning to midday, and then midday to nighttime in two bathrooms, and people would just would come in, and we're just pulling Kleenex after Kleenex after Kleenex after Kleenex in the two bathrooms and their whole thing was like, you know, oh, we 20% more or something like that. So all that to sell napkins or Kleenex or something like that. But I gotta stop skipping commercials. These yeah. Are, these sound awesome. Oh, uh, they're, they put money into these things. Yeah, commercials are, commercials are it. It's where all the money is these days. Music videos have diminishing budgets. We used to do cool stuff like that on music videos, but they don't have, the, no one buys CDs anymore. So how are you gonna make music videos to sell more CDs? It's all sure. done. It's too bad, actually. There was a lot of creativity in those days. So do you have a favorite camera that you like to shoot with? Or a favorite rig that... Mm, a favorite rig, rig camera combination that you just particularly like? There's... I shoot a lot of DSLRs, and I shoot a lot of... Uh, when I shoot for Twit, I get thrown in the fire because we have to stream. I'm wearing the Live View backpack, and we have to stream live, and we're going to crowded parties and conventions, and it's you could barely walk around like this the whole time. And the and I got to operate a camera. Is uh, yeah. it's uh, batteries and a yeah. set of several mm -hmm. uh, self, essentially cell exactly. phone radios in a backpack. Well, it's the old one had six cell phone cards in a computer that was mounted to your back, battery powered, and it would spit. It would convert the video signal from my EX1 through a box to the, and then send that video signal via cell phone cards, and then a server in the cloud would convert it to video signal and send it to uh, the station or to Twitch. So. That was really tough, but that rig, I would use a monopod, and I would have a head on top of that with a shoulder rig so that I could rest the shoulder rig and let go of the monopod, because we would go for three hours regularly, and it's very difficult to hold something three times this weight out in front of you for three hours while you're trying to frame, walk backwards, go up and down stairs, monitoring audio writing levels, writing the stop, you know, exposure, putting in and out gels on the light panel on top. It's like, it, it's abusive doing that job for them sometimes, but, but it really it gets your skills going. So that particular rig, I couldn't use a steady cam; would be too big. I couldn't use a tripod. I wouldn't walk with just the camera because sometimes I have to go up and over the crowd, so I'd use the monopod and put the camera up and above as we're walking shoulder to shoulder so that I'm not just looking at backs of heads. And I'm always running in front of them so I can shoot backwards so that we're not just seeing the backs of heads of the right. hosts the whole time. I, I, you know, if I was watching it, I'd rather see them, their faces. So I'm always running in front of them, looking back and shooting them while I'm running or walking backwards. And so that's one rig, is the monopod with a shoulder rig. And the shoulder rig is specifically for when I'm dead tired and I just gotta hang it. And it, it, the monopod rests against my body and the shoulder is there and I can just be hands off and just kinda operate while I'm like trying to open a water or something. And the uh, concept of the rock and roll bars is the next one. If I shoot DSLR, we do the shoulder rig with the two bars and the camera's forward. Same as an EX-1, but it's minus the monopod. And that is what's required for giving, you know, this golden triangle crap is just like, ugh, nah. This is really stable. And this is industry standard for high-end film was always to have a shoulder-mounted camera with two grips, pistol grips for the stability and you just have so much more because this becomes the triangle. It's your two hands, okay. your shoulder mount. So I guess the triangle thing is, I guess, whatever, the metaphor is okay, but 
not, not with your elbow and your shoulder. It's, it's two hands and your shoulder make a much more stable platform to do operations because this is much more stable than, than just one. Oh, so because you're turning at your waist, say, or with your body yeah. rather than yeah. depending on your arms. To There's a lot of that. And sometimes it just you, you have two elbows you can jam in if you need to. You're just more stable than having all the weight because what happens is you have, you have left and right tilt. And outside of that, camera rigs um, operate from tripods as often as possible. Uh, even if you're doing some run and gun type stuff, it's just you're just going to be better off being able to operate. If you need to deal with multiple subjects or things going on or long times and distance, uh, uh, Got it. distance meaning you need to zoom in, all those things, just tripod, tripod as much as you can. Now, that being said, I shoot from the hip all the time. I'll, you know, this crappy kit lens that came with this camera has a, had an image stabilizer, and so I turn it on, and it's pretty good. So I will all the time just shoot with just, because you can take this camera anywhere and at any time attention. and shoot video, and people never know, and, or they're not intimidated by it as much. And so I used to hate these cameras, but the image is beautiful. Very often, the image that comes out of the camera is just like, there's no way my EX-1 could have made that. Mm. So even with a bad codec, you know, some MPEG codec going to the cards, and, and it, it looks better. Larger sensor, but, there's a, but it's a terrible video camera. Mm. No microphone inputs. And there's all these other reasons why it's just like, I hate operating that camera. It's like, it's a stills camera. It's meant for operating. It's not designed to do what the EX, I would never take this on a Twit live stream. There's just no way, no way at all. Mm. I've recorded on cards and card to card to card on an EX-1 for three and a half, four hours at a time, where I just pull one out, put in the next, pull one out, pull in the next, and you no know, tapes and all these, all these things in the way cameras are evolving, um, they kind of go hand in hand with, with the rigs, but, uh, they, you know, we've talked about right. a couple cameras and their shortcomings of some and their, their strengths of others. and. Now, when you've done uh, your, your time-lapse uh, work, mm -hmm. have you ever had any problems with flickering in your end result? Oh, yeah, all the time. And what you do a lot of times is um, that one shot we watched before, which was the, the uh, chain in front of the, right. at Fort Point of Golden Gate. When I put that in, I shot those probably every, that day I probably did something like every four seconds. And... Uh, a lot of times I'll do a longer exposure to blur out anything that's moving because, you know, even the case in, in a slow motion time lapse, if the chain is theoretically moving in front of you, there would be a slight amount of motion blur. So a lot of times I'll do half second exposures or I'll do, uh, you know, just, just longer exposure, 30th of a second at least, something like that. But what happens is when you play them back at certain frame rates, you will get this stutteriness. I wouldn't call it flicker, but I'm, I'm assuming they're talking about this stutter look. And what you can do is in your render, I do everything in After Effects. And so I arrange my image sequence, and then I spit them out, and I do color correcting and do what I want to do. But I spit them out as 24, 30, and 60 frames per second often. And then I'll convert them. And I'll look at those three frame rates and see which one has less stutter. Because very often, it's just when you're, especially when you're moving, with the time lapse, that's what gets you this combination of the stuttery look, because you're doing a lateral camera move. And one of the biggest complaints about 24p uh, frame rate is lateral camera moves get this stuttery look. And you'll look mm. at many classic films. The one I can think of the most is um, the first Lord of the Rings. It's a big sweeping helicopter shot, and everybody's running across a mountain. And it's like got some okay. snow dust across it, and you just see that, and you can see that it's the helicopter sweeping shot and just too quick of a pan. They just, helicopter flew too fast or the pan of the camera was too fast. It just happens to be the timing of the moment where, oh, that looks a little stuttery. And a lot of people are really sensitive to that and they hate watching 24 and they don't want to shoot video at 24 because of that. Hmm. I've done a lot of animations for corporate clients where we've done the animations at 30 or 60 and delivered with 24p video footage because things moving on screen in an animation look stuttery if we rendered them out as 24. I see. Or we'd have to crank up the motion blur until you couldn't see what was moving on screen. So same thing with time-lapse. You can always, 
deal with them by uh, changing your frame rate usually. Okay. And then even if you had to spit something out as like 60 frames a second and your deliverable is going to be 24, you can then cross convert. Usually it will retain that look that was not as stuttery. So if you do need to deliver 24 and you spit out 24 and it's stuttery, I would suggest doing a pre-render at 30 or 60 and then converting to 24 or your deliverable. Good to know. Yeah. Um, so the next is about lighting for Twit. Mm. Uh, what lighting board did you use for Twit? And is there a way to control DMX lights by way of computer? Yes and yes. Or well, first one, not yes. The the board is it's not the MX. It's the um, the ETC Smart Fade 2496, and that board is it's sweet. I used to use ETC back in the day when I did uh, rock videos and all that kind of stuff, and they had this expression 2 2x and then the 3x, and they had these big crazy boards, and you control everything and and they came out recently with these smaller versions. And they have been uh, ETC's electronic theater controls is what they stand for. And they are super high end. They've been greatest, the greatest boards for longevity and, and, and ease of use for years and years and years. So this board is perfect for Twit. And I was going to get one of their moving lights. There's a Smart Fade ML, which stands for moving lights. But we don't have any moving lights. But we do have a lot of RGB. So it's kind of a toss-up, like, oh, do I want the moving lights board? But I would suggest that if anybody's going to get, if, just if anybody knows what that, the Smart Fade ML versus the 2496, I had a bunch of posts in the forum about this. Like, okay. Don't go with the ML for the uh, LEDs. Just go with the standard 2496 because you'll eat up your channels, but that's what you're going to do. So that's what I use at Twit. Um, there's a whole lot of lights in Twit that are RGB and RGBW, which means uh, there's a standard red, blue, green LED, and then there's some of them have a fourth one, which is a white LED, pure white. And that means that in the smallest amount of channels for that one light, will take up four channels because it has a channel for dimmer for each of those LEDs. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's kind of tough when you have 150 plus lights and you only have 96 total channels. You got to kind of uh. do some cloning of IDs and things like that. And second part of the question, DMX controllability for what was the other part of it? Uh, by way of uh, a computer. Oh yeah, absolutely. <coughs> there are there are USB interfaces. There are there are a couple protocol. There's multiple protocols <coughs> of DMX, but there are also multiple connectors. There's three pin and five pin XLR, XLR or DMX, and uh, the DMX signal travels over XLR cable. Standard three pin, like a microphone, is all that's needed, and then the five pin cables actually only use three of the five and two of the others are for doing pass-through and some other high-end stuff. But there are also Ethernet cable versions. And there are Ethernet cables that convert 5 or 3-pin to Ethernet. And a lot of those are how you will interface some DMX control into a computer. Or there's a USB to Ethernet, which can then get converted. So there's all these real simple converter tools. And there's lots of software. I just, I just heard about some, but if you, if you search for uh, DMX software. There's free versions. There's um, a lot of the LED sites that I've been buying from, and there are uh, DMX control boxes that are that are pretty price, uh, pretty cost effective. That you can build your own LEDs and get your own DMX controller box, and then there you go. The problem with those is that some of the power converters for LED are they flicker on camera because when you're converting LED, you get different colors by having red, green, and blue LEDs that are different intensities. Right. So that mixes the colors. And what happens is some of the cheaper solid state versions, there's like these remote control things you can point at, little LED things, and they'll change colors. Okay. If you push like a magenta, that means it's a blend of a red and a blue. Uh, or if you need like a, some other blend where one of the channels is dimmed a little bit, it's in this little box, and it's just kind of some cheap components that are basically making square wave alterations to the power that's going to I them. I see. So they're changing the duty yeah. cycle to the LEDs. Yeah, exactly. So your camera is wanting to see 60 cycles, pulsing at 60, you know, uh, our power is 60 cycles per second. And so the cameras have a similar shutter, and then things don't flicker on camera as long as everybody's in that world. But these cheaper LEDs, a lot of cheap Christmas lights, LED Christmas lights, you'll even see it to your eye. They'll kind of 
They look like they're flattery or flickery. Those are those cheap components. They're knocking off the square wave and not sampling it as often. So they will flicker on camera. So if you're planning on building a lot of things, your own custom LEDs, be careful of that. But I just got power brick converters and the DMX controllers, which have proven to be pretty solid. Great. Mm -hmm. Can you go into a little more detail about how you build, built the jib uh, camera rig for Twit? Yes, the jib was similar to this item here. The jib is tough because there's, uh, this is a two riser. This is essentially what is built some of it. And you, so you have one riser here, and this is all steel. And there's another riser here, which is all steel. And what I did was I put a three riser in there because of strength. This is only two risers. And I also needed to go a little bit longer distance. But what I did is I bought a steel um, three riser, what's called a baby stand, which is a, another, I think it's like three quarter inch, uh, full inch, and then an inch and a quarter, something like that. And then I modified a, another, there's about three pieces of grip gear that I, that I purchased and then chopped them all up and then modified a couple and then got a clamp and filed it and machined it and total custom build. But wow. it was essentially a three riser baby stand and the centerpiece from their, their junior boom, and a pipe clamp with a modified top for safety and for panability. So I put all those three things together and then got one of those dumbbell weight sets as a counterweight and just had to get a custom steel pipe for that, file all the insides of that so they'd go in together, and then put it all together with safety pins. So you know, if we have some crazy earthquake here, that thing, is, it's got like, triple redundancy safety because it's above Leo. So it's like you can't, you know, it's above everybody. Again, anything overhead of anybody. But safety. that rig was specifically designed because I had um, in my little home studio, if you imagine this was an engine, an actual engine for some of my engine building video stuff, um, I had an engine hoist and there was an engine hanging on the hoist. And so this whole entire thing that's about six feet long and five feet tall and, and it's got a 750 pound engine hanging from it. I wanted to get a shot that was going around this entire hoist. Right. And as I have, it's a, it's a garage conversion, it's a small home studio and I, I was like, well, I could either rent and I needed it for a long period of time. So I wasn't gonna rent a motorized turntable and put all that stuff on there a foot off the ground. So I was like, I'm just gonna move the camera around the object and so I just in, came up with the idea and invented the reverse jib <laughs> and, and it was a plumb bob point directly above you know its pivot point is directly above the subject and I had a little plumb bob and you'd position the things and then I would spin something around it and mount the camera and then you would just get a nice nice perfect spin and I would even run that through PF um, uh, I ran PF that track? through PF Ho oh. the cheaper one got it and uh, we did that with some other items, some products, and I put some, some grid boards around them, and it actually tracked just fine with my little reverse jib became this tabletop set. And then PF um, Ho would create the ground plane for us, and then we could just stick anything to that. We had graphics and part numbers coming in on the, that stuff. So Brilliant. Yeah, so all that just came out of a need to be like, I can't get a turntable for this engine hoist, so I just made the reverse jib. And then Leo inherited it. I'm going to have to make an invoice or something. Yeah. Well, it's made an impression. Everybody, <laughs> everybody talks about it. It's cool because it's very different. You know, that's, that's a, it's not like the nodal point of the camera, but it, instead of it moving the, the way your arm would, like this is a standard jib. You're, you're doing things like this. And what it does is it's, it's exactly the opposite, but it's kind of downrigged from here. So it's essentially doing, doing this which just looks different. It just looks, I mean, if you watch Twit, and I think Chad usually operates the jib in the very beginning, and it's a different way. It looks like you're taking the set and, and, and moving the set on a gimbal instead of, instead of your head looking out and around something. It's kind of like you're just there, and it's moving around you, which is, is really interesting. It's look. a neat effect. Yeah, it's fun. And so we have one, oh, go ahead. No, it's just low budget. <laughs> and well, that works great. Solve a problem, and then it's just come out with some cool things. So, yeah. We have one more question. Uh, about traveling with sliders. 
this mm. questioner says, I think Brent alluded to connecting uh, the sliders together. Mm -hmm. that we were talking about the uh, yeah. six foot uh, mini sliders. Six, 12, 18, 24, 30, and, 36. Um, this person's asking, would it be feasible to take a couple of these in a case to India if they wanted to shoot more than six feet of parallax goodness? Yep, they go all over the world with it. Ron Vito is Jerry Giacalone's partner, and Ron Vito is the camera operator on uh, the most recent Rambo movie. And there's pictures of Ron with, with Sly Stallone in the jungles, and you know he was, he was running around operating the um, his Steadicam guy, but he's the co-inventor of the, um, the slider, the co-owner. And Ron, there's a picture of Ron with the slider and, and Sylvester Stallone next to him on the Rambo set, and they send, they, they're just, they sit, there's a case, there's like hard cases, which are the big ones, which, uh, you know, this is the hard case for the little, um, little three-footer. But the cases go all the way up to the, the eight-footers are that big, and they have a soft case as well. And that's what I just started traveling with. Like this whole, this whole hard case is pretty solid. And it's a little bit much to carry around when you got the six-foot version, because that's what Joe and I were lugging around the first time we did okay. time-lapse. And then this year, they gave me the soft case. And that was just like checked luggage. I mean, it's, it's burly, it was big, but it's a big padded soft case and it was just not something where we put everything inside it. But, uh, sure. but 12, 12 to 24 feet of slider, motorized slider bits to India, yeah. They, I believe that there's people doing more of those planet Earth type things and they're talking to these guys about, about uh, using motorized sliders for, that was a really great example of some motorized slides or motorized time lapses in the uh, planet Earth DVDs. Right. Yes. Yeah. You know, there's underwater versions. There's like underwater fungus or sponges growing. There's the one that I can't figure out that I think is a cable cam maybe is a a sweeping tracking shot of a valley in probably Vermont or something that goes through all four seasons and it's this beautiful perfect sweeping. It looks like a helicopter shot. Hmm. It's obviously moving hundreds of yards over this entire year. And you watch all four seasons change from spring to, to the leaves growing to the autumn to winter with snow. And the, the most incredible part about that shot, if you, I think it's in the Planet Earth DVDs, but the exposure. I don't know how they nail the exposure. If they're going frame by frame and just matching with histograms and curves or something, but it's like each day, it's just, it's phenomenal. It's like you, you don't see the strobing and flickering. You're talking about a, a year. Right. of time lapse and you watch the shot and, and it doesn't make you feel like you're watching all the changes of light which are going to happen. So there's, there's details like that that when you start to think about moving time lapses or something or, or they, they go up the trunk of a, of a redwood tree or something, just big, big moves or beautiful things or even the smallest, most macro little move of a, of a seed growing with just a little teeny move is, is dramatic. You know, it's, it looks so cool. Wow. So if people wanted to learn a bit more about mm -hmm. camera rigging um, and all that goes on on the set. Mm -hmm. How about take well, my seminar? Is that well, what you're... I'm going to be there, yes. <laughs> all right, so good. Uh, your class, Camera, Light, and Shadow, mm -hmm. October 17th through the 19th, here yes. at Pixel here in this Studio room. We'll, in Petaluma. We'll, uh, we'll convert this room a couple times. You know, day one, we're going to treat it as if you're thrown in the fire on a music video set. And and they just say, go to it. And you've got to kind of struggle through and deal with some gear. Day one is like the boot camp, uh, learning a lot of gear, just getting, getting familiarized with, with things that you're going to see on every set. And then day two, we're going to be a little more polished about it, and we're going to, we're going to treat it as if you're maybe television or a commercial set. And you have a client to please. You're, you're paying a little bit more attention to detail, um, and you might need to light a product and, and shoot something for, again, a client and keep somebody happy who's not just a, a music video director where you're like, oh, we'll just get what we can get. Day three is when we're going to specifically deal with the narrative side of telling a story and being very meticulous about making sure that the story is respected in the way the camera moves and the light falls on characters and so. So each day we're going to try and take it through and, and give I don't want to say a, a boot camp, but a crash course, a, a film school in a week, in a three days. I don't know. It's, I'm just taking all of 
20 years of filmmaking and putting it into three days of this is this is what I've seen over and over and over and this is the quick start guide and and that's well, we could add some yelling and make it more like a boot camp yeah we could do that yeah we could do that push-ups <laughs> push -ups. Well, actually I, <laughs> sandbag lugging there's so much that repetitious cable <laughs> roll yeah exactly we, we, we'll do a little bit of that stuff but uh, it's gonna be much more philosophical brains stuff you need to know so but it'll be very useful very useful so if you want to learn more about uh, Brent's class, go to pixelcore.com. If you sign up and use the coupon code GMTBrent06, that will entitle you to $150 off the price of the class. Ooh, what's that? GMT, GMTBRENT06. All right. Correct. So Brent, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Um, it's, it's always fascinating to listen to you. Now, if folks wanted to get a hold of you uh, outside of the show, where would they do that? I believe that uh, just oceanstudio.com is kind of a placeholder for my consultancy with Twit. And so Ocean Studio, there's a singular, no S, there's only one. Oceanstudio.com has a contact at the bottom, an email. Great. And okay. uh, that site will, will grow and grow, especially with the class. That's part of the class is that we're going to teach and we're going to grow out, uh, decide what, what needs to be taught in what manner and then take some of that knowledge and then put it into that site so it can be revisited over and over for those who visit the class and for the public. Right. Can people follow you on Twitter? Yes, at Brent Bai. And I don't think I have a notion, just Brent Bai. So at Brent Bai. Yeah. B-R-E-N-T. B-Y-E. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this week at GMT Live. We'll see you next time. Let's go hang some cameras up. Yeah. More cameras. Don't you guys have some up top, too? <laughs>